Hi, welcome to Operation Solid Lives. This is level one, and this is our third lesson together. I want to talk to you and kind of continue on this theme that we've been going over, and that is how you are, I am, the people that God has created in his image are his delight. And I want you to see that not only are you his delight, but he actually has a dream for you. There's something he has thought of and has very creatively come up with that is the purpose for your life. And it's not just to breathe air and to exist. And as we've said, that, that breath that you have is special, but there's even something more special. So let's, let's take a look. Go back again to Genesis and let's review <clears throat> just this one statement in Genesis chapter 1. And I want to find verse 26 where... God says this, and I hope you have this memorized, where God says, let us make man in our image. He was looking for someone to have relationship with. He wasn't making man so man would just serve him. Of course, we're to serve God, and we're to obey God, and we're to honor God, and to fear God. But that's not why God created us, just to be like little uh, robots that go about doing things for him. We're, we're to have relationship with God. And right from the very beginning, this is what he is wanting us to understand. And this dream continues in what we talked about in Proverbs chapter 8. Remember that? Now look over there again. And I hope you have this memorized, but find it. Proverbs 8, and let's find verse 30 and 31. That's where we're told that wisdom says, I was God's delight, but my delight was with the sons of men. So there's something special now that's being revealed to us in the heart of God towards you and I. And this character, this person of wisdom, we found out last time together that this is Jesus, in fact. This is the, the Son of God. So here is this, this reoccurring theme. He wants relationship, and he's working at drawing you and I to him. In fact, we're told that no one comes to the Father except that the Spirit draws him. So this is something we know that he's been planning and he's been dreaming about this relationship. Okay, well, let's go to, I want to just have you see something in 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles 16, it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. In fact, I don't even have it written in my notes. I just have it memorized. 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9 says this, The eyes of the Lord are going to and fro through the whole earth looking for someone whose heart is loyal to him. Why? That he might prove himself mighty on their behalf. So God's looking for somebody, not who's perfect, not who's super special in any particular way, although I, I believe you are special. You're special in a lot of ways to God. But he's looking for a loyal heart. Wouldn't you like that said about you, that your heart's loyal? I believe some of you hearing me right now, your heart is loyal to God. And that's why he's getting a hold of you, because he wants to prove himself mighty on your behalf. Now, Enoch is an interesting character in the Bible. I want you to see him in Genesis 5. We're, we're, we're told in Genesis 5 and verse 21 <clears throat> that Enoch walked with God. He was just walking with God. And, and, and then we're told that all of a sudden, he was not. <laughs> he was walking with God, and then he wasn't here anymore. <clears throat> and he didn't die. He was walking with God, and look what it says. It says, and God took him. It actually says that he walked with God twice. Have you ever thought about why God took him? Well, we're not told in the Bible, but I have some assumptions that I'd like to make that I think are safe assumptions based on what we know about God's heart towards you and I. And that is, if he's looking for a heart that's loyal... His eyes are going around. He found a loyal heart in Enoch. And he said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you to be with me. I can't wait till you die. I want to have you right now. Now, <clears throat> this is an amazing thing because at that same time, we're, we're, we find in the Bible, and this is in Genesis 6, the next chapter over, Genesis 6, look at verse 5. We're, we're, we're told that men just became more and more evil. M more evil. They, in fact... It says that they only committed evil continually. Look at verse 6 of Genesis 6. It says man was 
uh, no longer God's delight because look what it says. It says he was grieved that he made man. And so God here has let sin go. He's let it go. Verse 7 tells us that he, he finally got down to one man that still was serving him. Who, who, do you know who that is? That's Noah. Look at verse 8 and it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. How long suffering is our God. Not only how his loving kindness is forever, so is his, his putting up with us. He, he can put up with us. And here he's putting up with man, merciful, compassionate, relenting. And finally, he, he said that I, I, I'm going to destroy man. But he found one man that had grace with him. And we're told in verse 9, the genealogy of Noah, look, at there, look there. It says that Noah was a, a just man, perfect in his generations. Now notice these words, Noah walked with God. Just like Enoch. Hey, that's not complicated stuff. I, I don't know if you uh, can remember when you started walking, but you did it a long time ago when you were a little baby. And uh, my little granddaughter's not only walking now, she's running and going in circles and jumping around. And it's amazing. It's not complicated. It's simple. Just to walk with God. That's who he's looking for. Now, I want you to see another friend that, that God finds here in Genesis 12. Would you go over to Genesis 12? Because you know what happened. Noah walked with God, but the Lord had to take Noah and his family up in that ark and he destroyed all the other people. Imagine those people so hard-hearted that they, they made fun of Noah. They didn't repent. They didn't turn from their sin. They were destroyed. Well, in Genesis 12, we're told that God found a man by the name of Abram. And he told Abram that he wanted him to leave his family and he would take him to a land. But this is an amazing thing. In fact, if you could put your finger there in Genesis 12, we'll come back there. Go over to Isaiah, because I want you to see something here in Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41 and verse 6 says that Abraham was a friend of God. Hear this. God wasn't looking for somebody to serve him. Abraham sure served him. He wasn't looking to some man to give a covenant to. He did give a covenant to Abraham. He was looking for someone to be his friend. Are you hearing that? That's an important thing to get in your mind and in your heart to realize God's not looking for somebody just to serve, just to do, just to obey. He's looking for somebody to be his friend. I, I want to be a friend of God. <laughs> Amen. Now look over here. We're told that he said to Abraham, he says, Abraham, if you'll walk before me, back in Genesis 12, if you'll walk before me and be faithful to me, I'll bless you and the whole earth, actually. And he did. Abraham walked with God. He went into covenant with God. And then look at chapter 17. Go to Genesis 17. <clears throat> We're told there that Abraham then was promised, and, and God made good on that promise, that he would be the father of many nations. Now, when it says many nations, that means many nations. And these aren't just physical descendants, but people of faith, like you and I. We're part of that. In fact, Galatians says that you and I, it, we are heirs according to the promise that was made to Abraham. Why? Because Christ has grafted us into the vine. Oh, man, it's so good. So we call him Father Abraham. Had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. He had a son named Isaac. He had a son then named Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Imagine this. God loved those, those men so much and loved Jacob so much that he said, I want, you to, I want you to be named after my people, my people Israel. Well, that's a pretty astonishing thing when you think about the character of Jacob, who, whose name means usurper, means trickster. And remember, he was the one that tricked his brother Esau out of his birthright for a bowl of lentil beans. And I I don't know, I like lentil beans, but to give up your birthright for that, that's pretty tricky. And uh, he did. He tricked his brother. And yet, God still used him. Can I just say right now that God will still use you no matter how many tricks you've played? <laughs> I've played a few. And I'm thankful he hasn't thrown me out. He's still working with me, still dealing with areas of my life. Why? Because he loves me. Because he loves us. Amen? Now, these 12 sons that Jacob had, one of them is very interesting. His name was Joseph. 
Remember the story of Joseph? He had a dream, and Joseph saw him leading out over his brothers. And he had this, this dream that he was over them. Well, they didn't like that. <laughs> I, I, I probably wouldn't like you coming and sharing a dream with me about you being over me. But I don't think I would do what his brothers did. His brothers sold him into slavery. They were going to kill him, but they decided they better not at one of the brothers' advice. And they listened to him, and they, they sold him into slavery. And now here's Joseph, a young man who had a dream he felt was from God, sitting in jail. He's been lied about, double-crossed. All of the prospects of, of the future look very bleak. He's in a foreign country. Imagine that. Sitting in a prison cell with the equivalency of being a slave as far as your identity. And they find out he, he has an ability to interpret dreams. Potiphar remembered this because Pharaoh had a dream that he wanted interpreted. So... You know the story. Joseph goes and interprets the dream and gets great favor with Pharaoh. Look how God is weaving this story together. And I want you to see part of it is a picture of your life. You've been in faraway places, uh, maybe not locations, but some of you have been in faraway locations, far not only away from loved ones, but far away from God. Some of you know what it's like to wake up in a jail cell and have a horrific memory of something that you did and now you're now you're going to face some consequences listen i want to tell you right now god can find you right where you're at right there and still have the plans and purposes for your life come true why because he has a dream for your life and he did for this young boy joseph well 430 years go by and joseph you know he's raised up he helps the people of israel during the, the famine but we're told that there was a king that arose that did not know Joseph. He began to put the people of Israel, and here they are, they're slaves in this country. He began to put them under horrible bondage, taskmasters, and, and was very cruel to them and killed their babies when their babies were born. And guess what? The people, they began to cry out to God. Now, if, if I was God, and I bet you're glad I'm not, but if I was God, uh, I wouldn't want, you know, I would say if you're going to cry out to me, it's too bad because you're getting what you deserve. You don't want anything to do with me. Now you're in trouble and you're going to cry out to me. Not, not God. Mm -mm. He, it says he heard the voice of his people cry. He saw the oppression and the stuff that they were going through. And he found a man named Moses, raised him up, a man who didn't believe in himself. There's another picture of some of us where, where he had given up. You know, he, had, he was raised in the courts of Pharaoh. And then he had that, that terrible mishap where he killed one of the Egyptian soldiers and his own people rejected him. And he went down to a place called Midian, out in the middle of nowhere, just giving up on God, giving up on life, giving up on just any potential, which so many of us do. Now, we may not do it real dramatically, like move to a foreign country or move to another, uh, but our hearts get moved. We just put them over on a shelf. We give up dreaming. God doesn't stop dreaming. He's still got a dream. And he says, Moses, you're going to be used by me. I've heard my people. They're crying out. We're going to deliver them. And I'm going to use you to do it. And the lesson here is that when you have a covenant with God, that's why those covenant teachings are so important in our faith builders. Because you've got to learn that when God makes a covenant, it can't be broken. I don't care how much you and I try to break it. It's not between us. It's between God and God. Hallelujah for that. Now, look at Exodus 19. Let's, let's, let's delve a little deeper into this story of Moses. Because God's raised him up to release his people. Uh, you remember, he sent the plagues and the different things. And then the Passover. And then in verse 4 of chapter 19, after they've come out of Egypt, listen to what God says. He says, I delivered you. That's what verse 4 says. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians. You can depend on me, God says. Hey, I took care of them. Everything's going to be all right. I hear God saying that right now. Everything's going to be all right. If he can get you out of Egypt, he can get you through the wilderness. If he can get you through the wilderness, guess what? He can get you through this next day. Hallelujah. Well, he says, you can depend on me. Look at this. He says, I'll take care of you. This is verse 4. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Verse 5, 
He says, where, where, where did I bring you? I brought you to myself. Do you remember that? I didn't bring you to a place. I brought you to me. Oh, man. See, he wants to be with his people. He wants to be with you. He wants to be with us. I, I would say he wants to be with you more than you realize. Uh, we, we we're struggling sometimes, like in ministry. Oh, we want to have the presence of the Lord. Like it's some kind of thing we got to like work at. No, no, no. We don't. I don't think that's it at all. I think we just need, need to make ourselves more sensitive to the fact God's already here. He says, I'm here and I ain't leaving. I'm here. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. God, help us be more sensitive to your presence. So the God that we're hearing about right now, this God in the book of Genesis, this God in the book of Exodus is still the same. Even though the people sin, even though they made rebellious, hard-hearted decisions, they repented and he responded. Let's keep with uh, Exodus 19 and I want you to come to verse 5 because this idea of God wanting to be with the people is really spelled out in verse 5. It says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Now, there's that daily delight, but there's a condition here. God wants to be with us. He wants you to know. He wanted his people to know then and still does that they're a special treasure to him. But he wants us to obey the voice of his command. Now, why do you figure that is? Well, let me put it in terms of parenting. I tell my kids, even now, they're all adults, but I will tell my kids, hey, don't do that. That's dumb. That's a dumb thing to do. And they, they, they don't do many dumb things. But how many know you've had to tell your kids every now and then? Uh, watch out here. Why, why do you do it? Because you love them. You don't do that because you're trying to be restrictive and mean and unconditional in your love. No way. You're trying to say, look, if you and I are going to have a relationship here, I want to help you. I want to keep you safe. The commandments were not given to make us miserable. They were given to us to keep us safe, to keep us out of harm's way, to let blessing flow from God to our lives. So here he is, he's saying, keep my covenant, keep follow me, obey me. And this is the eternal God speaking. Keep my covenant and I'll be with you. Now, let's go on to chapter 25. Go to Exodus 25 and let's find verse 8. Would you find that? Make a sanctuary, he says, that I may dwell among them. Make a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, I want to go over a couple of chapters. I'm going to come back to this, though. But just look at Exodus 29. Jump from 25 to 29. And verse 45. Exodus 29, verse 45. Listen, he says, I will dwell among the children of Israel, and I will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them up out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Now, dwell, dwell with them. The God who created the universe that all of these smart scientists can't even measure. They don't even know how many solar systems there are in the universe. There's billions and billions of stars. The God who created all that, he wants to dwell with a little group of people in a in, in a wilderness area uh, of Israel in, in the desert, uh, it, it's just phenomenal when you start thinking about it in those terms. And he says, "Build me, build me a tent." Now get a hold of this. They're living in tents. He says, "I, I want to live where you're living." So he they built him a tent, and he lived there. He came and. His Shekinah, as it's called in the Hebrew, glory filled that tent and later the tabernacle. So much so that when Moses would go in and visit, it said that he went into that little tent in Shiloh until they built the tabernacle. And he visited God and talked to him just like I'm talking to you right now. Only uh, you can't talk back to me, which is wonderful. But no, I'm kidding. It, it, it was a back and forth conversation they had. But listen, when he went out, his face was so bright from the glory of God. They had to cover his face. God saying, I want, I want to be with you. I want to be with you. So they built him a tabernacle and, and he said, put it in the center. 
I want. I don't want to be over on the east side, the west. I want to be right in the middle. He's still saying that, by the way. I want to be right in the middle of your life. And this pillar of cloud by day, uh, I've heard people talk about all these spiritual things. You know what the big deal, uh, I want to get across to you? It was for their comfort. Remember, you're his delight, and he wants to have you have things that are enjoyable. And in the desert, it gets hot in the day, and that cloud kept him cool. And then at night, it gets cold in the desert. I've been out there in the winter sometimes, you know, I'm telling you, it'll get cold. Well, that pillar of fire, that cloud would turn some supernatural way into a, a pillar of fire, and it kept the people warm. Again, listen to how practical his plan is. Listen to how practical his love is. He's taking care of his people right out there in the desert. And I believe he's wanting you to hear him say he'll take care of you too. He, he gave him the dimensions of the temple, and he said, uh, here, here's, here's how I want it done. So God does have certain expectations, but what I want you to see, though, is when you love somebody, of course you have expectations. But one of the biggest ones that I, I, I still remember is you want to live with the person you love. And uh, you got to get married first, though. If you're, uh, you're shacked up, God can't bless that relationship. You, you got to get married. And he'll bust it. And by the way, you're never ready to get married, so I don't know what you're waiting for. You just should do it. Numbers 13. Go over there. Numbers 13. And uh, find verse 1. Numbers 13. And uh, listen, listen to this unfortunate, uh, you, this familiar stuff here for you, but let's just review it. Uh, we're told that they, went, they sent spies into the land. And I won't read the whole passage, but we're told that the land was excellent. Look at the grapes. We we're told the grapes were so large, it, it took two men to carry on a stave one of the uh, clusters of grapes. In fact, that's still on the uh, Ministry of Tourism for Israel's uh, letterhead, their logo, has those spies carrying that, that stave of grapes. And the, the report should have been, man, God has hooked us up. We are, this is awesome. Instead, they came back, and 10 of them had a bad report, didn't they? In fact, the translations, uh, the, the New King James has it. They have an evil report. They had an evil report. And they said, we're like grasshoppers, not only uh, grasshoppers in the giant's eyes, but in our own eyes. Well, there's that confidence thing that we were talking about before. But two, two spies, do you remember their names? Yeah, that's right. Those, those dear men, Caleb and Joshua, they said, no way, we're well able we can go in right now if God's for us. Well, God rejected Israel because Israel rejected them. That generation, we're told, look at, look at chapter 14. Just browse through there on your own a little bit. Look at those first few verses and you find out how God feels. And you start to, you know, you realize here they've their children were being killed. They're being tortured and uh, the horrible bondage in Egypt. He pulls them out of there, builds a tabernacle right in their midst, dwells with them, feeds them, clothes them. You know how amazing it is that the Bible says that the clothing never wore, they had sandals that never wore out for 40 years. They had, none of them ever got sick. They never got hungry. God took care of them, provided for them supernaturally, built a place for them, and then they start complaining. They start complaining about the food, and uh, I'm telling you, you can, you can see how God's heart gets grieved here. Look, look over at chapter 14 again, but go down to verse 22. Uh, let, let me paraphrase this a little bit. He says, you don't want me. Okay, then only two of you are going to be allowed back in. And the rest of that generation, we're told, died out there in the wilderness, and their children got to go back in. And... That was because the promise was made to Abraham. You remember the promise he made to Abraham? He said, your seed shall multiply and be great. Well, he killed off those hard-hearted parents, but the children were coming in now with Caleb and Joshua. They're the only two of that generation that made it. But I'm wondering as they're going across the river, you know the story, they go in, they, the, there's the walled city of Jericho, they march around it, and the walls fall. But I'm wondering as they're crossing the river, if God's thinking, I hope these guys want to be with me like I want to be with them. Their parents didn't want to be with me. They didn't care. They complained. They bellyached. I, I wonder if the kids are going to want to be with me. Now, 
let me just say something. I'm seeing a generation rise up around me of young people that want to be with him, I think, more than I do. They love God. And you know why? Because the devil's overplayed his hand. He's shown them too many things that are wrong, too many things that are nothing like the God that they serve, and they're, they've sold out like Joshua. They're, they're a Joshua and Caleb generation that's being risen up, and I love it because that's been God's plan right from the start. Remember, this is God's dream for you. Now, go over to Deuteronomy with you, with, with me, and I was going to say if you can find Deuteronomy, that's happiness because sometimes that's a little harder to find. And find chapter 7, Deuteronomy chapter 7. And uh, he's talking to the second generation. And uh, in verses 1 through 8, let me, let me just, I won't read it all, but I want, here's what he says. Now again, if I was God, you know what I'd say, look, your parents were a bunch of bums and you're probably going to be a bum too, so I got my eye on you because I, I know an apple doesn't far, fall too far from the cart and nor a nut from the tree or whatever we say. Hey, that's not what God says. Look, look what he says. He says, no, you're my special treasure. That's because his dream doesn't change. It stays the same. And look, he says it again. Look over at chapter 14 of Deuteronomy. Can you get there? 14 verse 2. Look, 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 he just says it again. You're going to be my special treasure. I mean, it's relentless. It's like this old broken record, you know, the old love song that just keeps playing over and over and over and over again. God's saying, look, you, 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 you've had a, a heart that has been against me, but I'm going to forgive you. Repent, turn towards me, and I'll receive you because you're special to me. And, and then it says there that this has been my plan all along, that we would be together. Well, Hallelujah for that, because I'm going to tell you right now, that's still God's plan. L listen to Psalm 78. And uh, can you find verse 1? Psalm 78. And find just that first verse there. They're delivered from, from God. And this is an amazing... I'm going to actually... I want to read just for a moment from... Look at uh, verse 5, Psalm 78. This is such an uh, unbelievable chapter. It says, He established the testimony in Jacob and appointed. Who is that, Jacob? That's Israel. And he appointed law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make known to their children that a generation to come might know them. See, God's saying, I'm not just after you, I'm after your kids. I'm, I'm going to be faithful to them. Will you, will you remember that if you're a parent? That's encouraging because sometimes your kids can get off track and you think, God, what, what? Listen, just lift them up in prayer. And God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be as faithful to them as I was to you. But here's God's heart. Here's God's heart for his people. And look down at verse 10, though. It says, and they did not keep the covenant of God and they refused to walk in his law and they forgot, verse 11 says, they forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them, all the marvelous things that he did in the sight of their father and in the land of Egypt. They forgot it all. And then it lists all of these things. The psalm writer, Asaph, lists all these things that God did and how the people responded and how he relented and came back and tried to help them. And, and yet look at verse 22, it says, they did not believe God and did not trust his salvation. He would bring the clouds from above and open the heavens and, and bless them. And then look at manna. They had manna, which is actually called here angels' food in verse 25, and fed them every day so that they could eat. And then down at verse 33, it says, and their days he consumed in futility and their years in fear. Well, that was that 40 years of wandering as a result. So he destroyed the firstborn in that generation. That's what verse 51 tells us. But look at verse 52. But he made his own people go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. He led them safely and they did not fear, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. And he brought them to his holy border and he drove out the nations from before them. And yet... We're told that they provoke God. Look at verse 56. They did not keep his testimonies. So this is just that constant, constant back and forth, back 
and forth, and then down at verse 71. Verse 70 is one of my favorite parts of this whole entire psalm. He says he chose David. He found a guy named David, just a little shepherd kid. And it says he took him from the sheepfolds. <laughs> and from following the ewes that had young, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart. May I say that God's still looking for that kind of leader. And I hope one of you, I hope a lot of you, in fact, I hope many of you, become leaders like that. Now, look at Zechariah. That's over towards the end of the Old Testament. And I, I told you right from the start, I wanted to show you from the very beginning, first pages of Genesis to the last part of the Old Testament. The next week, we're going to look at the New Testament. But look what Zechariah, this prophet, is told by God to prophesy in this way. Zechariah 2 and verse 10. Zechariah 2, verse 10. After 400 years of all of the, the, the problems in Israel and wondering when the Messiah is going to come, it's as if Zechariah is speaking on God's behalf, pulling the, the curtain of time away. And listen to what he says. He says, Rejoice, you who are barren. Shout and sing, for I'm coming for you. Hmm, sounds familiar, doesn't it? That same heart. God says, look, you guys have wanted nothing to do with me, but I can't give up on you. I won't. I, I'm, and I'm sending one who's going to solve this relationship problem that we've got permanently. Now look at what Jeremiah says. I want to show you something, and this is absolutely awesome. Jeremiah 31. And uh, we're, we're, we're told there that he's going to come. Let, let me just tell you what it says in my own words. He says, I, I'm going to come and I'm, I'm going to write a law, not on stone. I'm, I'm, we're going to have a covenant. It's not going to be on tablets. It's not going to be in a book. It's not going to be some religious thing. It's going to be written on your heart. And how does he do that? I'm going to do it by my spirit. My spirit's going to come upon your sons and your daughters. My spirit is going to make real the things of God. So rather than complying with the law, I've now fallen in love with a Savior. That's been God's dream right from the beginning. 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 From the beginning.